Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so let's start. Right. Yes, good evening, friends. On behalf of the Department of English, University of Gorbongo, let me welcome you to the last lecture of the online lecture series Parlay 2021 that we are organizing. It's our, our pleasure today to have in our midst Professor Laura Doyle. Laura Doyle is Professor of English, College of uh, Humanities and Fine Arts, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, U United States of America. Professor Doyle today is going to talk about interimperiality. In fact, our 2020 book, Interimperiality, Buying Empires, Gender Levers, and the Literary Arts of Alliance is the basis of this lecture. And she is the conferee of many awards and accolades, a pioneering scholar in this field. She is going to address us today. So without further ado, let me now request Professor Doyle to address us. And with this, I will disappear from the screen and leave it to Laura. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhattacharya, and to all of you. Um, I'm very honored to be here and to discuss my work with you um, and be part of your very rich series. Um, so thank you. So as Amit said, I will be drawing on my book, Interimperiality, um, mainly today to reflect on the difficulties of ethical alliance and the need for different kinds of configurations and thinking about our alliances. Um, I do believe that the crises of the present uh, cry out for renewed forms of, of, of dialogue and alliance across regions and positionalities, including within academia. And uh, I would suggest that only a fuller reckoning with the world's long imperial and androcentric pasts can generate grounds for the mutual recognition and temporal perspectives we need to build these alliances. Also in this context, I'd like to note that writing this book on interimperiality, which was 12 years in the making, was itself enriched and enabled by the dialogues, alliances, and collaborations of the World Studies Interdisciplinary Project at UMass. Uh, this is a decolonial de research collective that I co-direct with Mongi Wakatinji, my colleague in economics at the university. Over the past eight years that this collective has been growing, um, one of our key words became slow cooked because there emerged a sort of different sense of timing among us that was far afield from the institutional discourses of productivity. I'm convinced that the future of decolonial work depends on similarly slow cooked collaborative work across regions, disciplines, identities, languages, and periods. So it's in that spirit that I really value this opportunity to meet with you. So thank you in advance for your listening and dialogue. So in, uh, I should say that the title of my lecture um, is Undoing Disavowal, Living Coeval Time, The Labors of Decolonial Alliance. In interimperiality, I bring together dialectical theory and non-Eurocentric world historiography to reframe long historical processes of economic state and cultural formation. I focus on the fact that in most periods from ancient times to today, there have been several contemporaneous empires and several vying hegemonies, rarely only one. The optic of interimperiality makes visible the degree to which multipolar forces of colonization 
have unfolded together with multipolar energies of alliance, resistance, and caretaking labors. The inter of interimperiality thus refers to dialectically entangled relations among empires and among those who endure, create, and maneuver among empires. So in the, in the lecture, I will be drawing, you know, directly from material in the book, but I've tried not to uh, just read what's there and to, uh, of course, shorten uh, what's there, but also, um, you know, really condense and, and highlight certain dimensions here. This tracking of empires' interconnected expansions and their extractive capital accruing economies over two millennia in regions from the Americas to Afro-Eurasia clarifies several fundamental formations, at least in my eyes. And I highlight just a few of them initially here. First, this long view exposes the degree to which competitive inter-imperial relations have on one hand long driven the intensifying extractions homogenizations and coercive installations of material and political systems. On the other hand, the long view reveals how resistance by communities and persons caught among empires has generated creative navigating and maneuvering inside the household as well as outside, which sometimes in its turn has forced defensive adaptations by states, rulers, owners, and men in the household. The long historical interimperial lens also enables better understanding of regions that have been called peripheries within colonizer, colonized, and center periphery models of empire. It brings to light the ways that they should also be understood as interimperial battle zones shaped over centuries by changing political and linguistic regimes. The, um, and the frictions and affiliations of which feed into the conflicts of the present. This approach also makes clear how the systematic control of race and gendered reproduction has long operated as a structural matrix of these dynamics, generating stratified political economies through laws of inheritance and marriage. Finally, in the realms of culture, the long view establishes the crucial role played by languages and literatures and the arts in these world historical processes. I can't see you, but that's okay. Can you hear me okay? Uh oh. Yes, we can. Oh, good. Okay. Oh. Because, of course, my screensaver came on. So I'm <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Um, so the arts have played crucial roles in these long historical processes, and they're instrumentalized by states and retooled by communities who maneuver within this existential political condition. Given these interlocking dimensions of state, economy, language, and culture, I argue that it is not only the materialities of empires that have accrued dialectically over millennia, but also forms of relation and imagination through which communities have endured in this interimperial force field. In short, the long historical and dialectical framework I develop in the book aims to expose the degree to which we all occupy a deeply sedimented condition of interimperial positionality, although in distinctly unequal ways. As the politics and violence of today make clear, these accruing legacies have persisted and they electrify visions of peace, of reparation, and of revenge. The point of studying deep time history in this way is not to cover all of history or simply establish new historical facts or create a new master narrative of world history. The point is, first of all, to cultivate the perspectives and feed the collaborative energies that allow us to reflect, act, and theorize together about the pasts that determine our troubled present. To do so, we need, I think, to honor and fathom, to some degree, the ways that human communities have understood and lived in dif different epistemologies of time and history, differently and often at odds, yet still forming those in relation to other communities around them. At its best, the long perspective enables us to ground ourselves downward as we feel our way forward for it continually refocuses our attention on how history inhabits our habitats, lives in and through our intertwined bodies over many generations, bodies which in the present nonetheless continue changing, resisting, adapting, and struggling. 
when cultivated intentionally through genuine listening, this attention can open the way to more sustaining relations, to reconfigured interregional interpositional thinking and alliances, I believe, among differently embattled communities. To explore these possibilities today, I take as my point of departure Johann Fabian's well-known exposure of the denial of coevalness, that's his phrase, embedded in the Eurocentric episteme. Fabian touched the existential heart of human violence when he named colonialism and racism as the denial of coevalness. In his critique of the epistemologies of time encoded in European anthropology study of the other, he exposed the casting of non-European peoples as pre-modern or primitive and explained this as a practice, uh, this practice as a denial of co-presence. I suggest that Fabian's insights can now be deepened by recent intersectional feminist and decolonial thinking, as well as by new kinds of long historical reflection. Recent work by scholars um, as different as Nadia Alcho, Dupesh Chakravorty, and Elizabeth Freeman allows us to unpack what we could call andro-imperial time and its accretions over the long durée. As Fa Fabian famously said, quote, geopolitics has its ideological foundations in chronopolitics. As I argue in the book, this kind of chronopolitics, the inter-imperial view of chronopolitics um, is, or the inter-imperial nature of chronopolitics is embedded in the notions, for instance, of translatio imperium, the passing of the torch from empire to empire, as well as in periodizations of pre-modern and modern. Today, I'll particularly emphasize the ways in which this chronopolitics depends not only on denial of co-presence, but very importantly, on disavowal of the labors of co-sustenance, which those, the, that disavowal, we might also know, could shape, uh, I think does shape what Achille Ndembe calls necropolitics. I'll also keep in view the ways that the unrecognized labors of care have nonetheless sustained colonized, gendered, and other imperially, inter-imperially embattled communities, even when not all members acknowledge or much less share those labors. It seems to me that naming the full surround of disavowals is a crucial step toward a viable coevalness. I use the term disavowal more often than denial in order to highlight that this practice is not only a matter of rejecting, refusing, or repudiating, which comprise the standard definitions of deny. It also involves a bad faith posture and equivocation captured in the term disavowal, which according to the dictionary, this claims knowledge of, responsibility for or connection with. As I'll emphasize the disavowal of co-evilness by powerful groups disclaims connection with the very people who sustain their lives, those who provide the food and tend the households, those who serve ruling groups as well as struggling families. In the economy, in, in, in this economy, the health of some is gained at the expense of the health of others. Moreover, these forms of disavowal are usually also authorized by continually reenacted discursive denigrations of those who serve. The wear and destruction wrought by these necropolitical habits may find full actualization in genocides and wars, or they may unfold through what Rob Nixon calls slow violence, including environmental racism, the culture of rape, the lack of reproductive support for women, or jobs that simply work laborers to death. Strikingly, in his choice of the word coeval, Fabian implicitly drew attention to the principles of well being and the theft of it created by disavowal. For at its root, the term coeval denotes not only co origination, but also more specifically a shared vitality over a long coterminous lifespan. Co, of course, derives from the Latin root for together or in common, and the syllable eva in coeval derives from the Proto-Indo-European Sanskrit root aiw or ayu, meaning vital force, life, long life, longevity, eternity, which in Latin had became avum or age over time. 
AIW is also the root of the word hygiene, traditionally understood to denote healthy and literally meaning living well. Attributes, for instance, personified in the Greek goddess Hygieia. In short, full recognition of coevalness entails full acknowledgement of the co-sustenance that makes possible an enduring temporal coexistence. Against the coeval temporalities of longevity and vitality, we may place the theft of vital time from peoples and persons throughout history. Such etymologies can also point us back toward the early forms of dialectical thought allowing us to trace and honor a deep historical, linguistic, and philosophical, philosophical encoding of this existentially necessary interdependence. These include, for instance, as many of you undoubtedly know, the central Buddhist principle of, as translated, dependent origination, also understood as co-arising or interdependent co-arising, which acknowledges that nothing possesses its own irreducible self nature, but everything depends on something else for its existence. As expressed in the Majima Nikaya, quote, when this is, that is, this arising, that arises. When this is not, that is not. This ceasing, that ceases. This principle is also embedded in the Taoist concepts of interpenetration and co-forming plurality, part of the traditions of thought that influenced the development of dialectical thought among German thinkers in the West. And this has been, uh, you know, I, I, there are footnotes on this in the book. Um, in interimperiality, I draw on this legacy of thought to trace the ways that both humans and polities originate within a condition of dependent origination and dynamic co-formation. This point becomes clear when we recall, as so few philosophies do, that a person's physical uh, that a person's physical survival depends from birth on another person who brings sustenance from the material world. G. W. F. Hegel's famous lord and bondsman arrived late on this scene, when Hegel positions the lords and bondsmen's physical contest for control as the original intersubjective moment. Much gets erased in one stroke. For his life or death story of struggle over labor has no women in it. Yet without women's labors as well as men's, there is neither lord nor bondsman in the first place. As with persons, polities are also co-constituted and co-formed, despite all disavowals to the contrary. We might recall that a state's claim to sovereignty must be recognized by other states to exist or have force. Moreover, most empires, kingdoms, nations, villages, depend materially on trade, a relational activity. Even an embargo expresses a negative relation. Thus, neither persons nor polities have an original a priori independence to revive or defend. No pure origin, only fraught co-origination co requiring labor in every sense. Can you still hear me? Is all well there? Yes, we can. You okay. are perfectly audible. I'm looking at this black screen. It's very disconcerting. I'm going to just bring up the screen again very quickly so I can glimpse you again. All right. Hello. Um, and yet, although dialectical thought, as it has developed in different times and regions, acknowledges a fundamental existential relationality, it typically also stops short of the full coeval picture. In order to think back through our caretakers, to uh, paraphrase Alice Walker, who wrote famously about thinking back through our mothers, and to think back through the systems that have exploited them, we need, I think, to think from outside the implicitly masculinist, raced, and Eurocentric frameworks and formations that have left gaps in dialectical thought. Today I'll begin, um, or I'll go forward from here by briefly parsing the ways that Hegel on one hand stops short of this thinking, and yet on the other hand also lays rich ground for naming disavowal as constitutive of the dialectics of struggle. I'll then describe how dialectics and disavowal work at the macro level of interimperial and gendered or raced formations, which sometimes also run along the lines of religious difference. Finally, I'll offer some brief literary readings um, to illustrate literature's interventions in these economies. 
Okay, which I think have work uh, implications for our work as intellectuals today. So I should say that the lecture is um, a little under an hour, maybe 55 minutes. So um, I hope you're comfortable. In his implicit reworking of Indo-Chinese and Mediterranean forms of dialectical thought and phenomenology of spirit, Hegel begins by noting that although what he calls the matters or the forces of the world's phenomena appear as independent entities, in their experienced unfolding, they are, quote, each where the other is. They mutually interpenetrate. He further argues that all, all matters, and this is his word for phenomena, really, that are, he sees as very dynamic. All matters are, and this is his phrase, absolutely porous or are sublated, by which he means that phenomena are co-constituted in perception by their differentiating relation to each other. And here it's worth you know, re-emphasizing that Hegel is not writing a positivist or ontological philosophy, but a phenomenological one that tries to describe how phenomena are perceived by humans. For instance, when he comments on the lived distinction between night and day, Hegel does not define night and day as opposing objective poles but rather as differentiated interpenetrating elements for perception. So day is the negative that subtends the human statement, now it is night. Day is not night's opposite, but rather its condition of perception and naming. In this way, day is also preserved, to use Hegel's word, in the perception, now it is night. And of course, all along here, this is all in translation, it's important to say. Um, the talk, my words, my quotes, the result is not a synthesis of thesis and antithesis, as, as you know, some uh, Alexander Kojev and others misrepresented Hegel's thought, but rather an interpenetration of sublated elements whose co-forming presence, Hegel posits, is continuously active in future moments, sometimes powerfully catalytic and destabilizing, especially in the political realm. When Hegel turns to humans, these dynamic interpenetrations and sublations become more agonistic, more fraught with peril. The concept of sublation enters more centrally to name both the conflictual ener energies of encounter and the disavowals of appropriation that emerge in these encounters, including what with Fabian we can call negations of coevalness. Hegel, first of all, emphasizes that each human encounter entails a pressure to adapt to or subsume the dis distinguishing differences of other actors. As he puts it, in any encounter, each finds itself as an other being and, he says, each wishes to supersede this otherness of itself. The wish is not only to supersede the other being, but specifically to supersede the othering effect of that onlooker's presence and gaze which prompts a desire to overcome a threat of domination by that onlooking being who perceives the first self as an object for its vision. Yet in Hegel's account, this coeval intersubjectivity is a competitive, volatile, zero-sum situation. Both persons, them, both persons are simultaneously perceiving and perceived, and both fear and seek domination. Hegel stresses the wish for control arising from these encounters, which drives, he says, a double movement or a simultaneous exchange of practices between the actors. That is, in this agonistic relation, one person borrows from and imitates the other exactly and ironically in order to counter control by that other. Hegel's words again, each does itself what it demands of the other and therefore also does what it does only insofar as the other does the same. Paradoxically, to manage the other, other's gazing presence and to maintain independence, each acts more like the other. We might think here not only of what has been called appropriation, but also of what Homi Baba called colonial mimicry and Barbara Fuchs discusses as imperial and cultural mimesis. As I see it, this competitive mimicry and sublation as practiced among states drives the globalizing homogenization and centralization of systems. Inter-imperial theory considers this pattern of existential yet disavowed co-formations as a first principle in its analysis of both state and interpersonal relations. 
While Susan Butt Morris rightly links Hegel's early 19th century thinking with his contemporaneous entanglement in the slavery-based empire-building economy of the Atlantic world, I would also widen that horizon to include the co-forming global field of imperial competition and appropriative system building that would encompass, for instance, in the 17th century, the Chinese, Russian, Ottoman, and Safavid empires, as well as the French, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, British, and, and you know, rising US American empires. To secure the stance of autonomy and independence in the face of this entanglement, both the appropriative borrowing and the sense of threat must be disavowed as dramatized, I will just mention in the discourses of Orientalism. The other's powers and practice practices must be incorporated, distorted, denigrated, and sublated, and then that genesis must be erased. Yet all along, a certain contingency and precarity trouble this process and its zero-sum, win-or-lose understanding of relations. The denial of dialectical interdependency promises that there will be a struggle, and it will be a struggle over labor. As you know, Hegel famously and infamously distills the struggle by positing a primal scene in which two men literally battle one another for domination. In his account, when one man has achieved enough physical control to threaten his rival with death, the other concedes defeat to save his own life. It's at this point, Hegel posits, that the dominant man can claim control of the labors of the bondsman. Coercive control of labor is here installed as the very fulcrum of relations. This fulcrum bears further pressure, as Hegel points out, because the dominant man practices disavowal. He harbors a cloaked awareness that he is actually, the awareness that he is dependent on, coeval with that laboring man, insofar as the bondsman performs the labor that sustains the life of the Lord. The Lord, therefore, is, in Hegel's words, not certain of being for itself as the truth of himself. His discomforting awareness of being othered and being co-constituted with others cannot be wholly assuaged. It is all the more interesting then that in Hegel's account, the bondsman also develops, also develops a cloaked awareness, not only of the master's dependence on him, but also of his own making and laboring powers. Less attention has been paid to this aspect of Hegel's primal scenario. As if unwittingly letting the cat out of the bag, Hegel strikingly proposes that the bondsman develops a productive and empowering self-relation through his work with things in the material world. The laborer's work is first of all, materially productive insofar as his quote, work forms and shapes the thing, that's Hegel. Moreover, this relation to things produces a certain consciousness, again in translation in Hegel's words, in the bondsman, shaped by knowledge of an existential truth that, like night and day, independence and dependence interpenetrate. Through work, the laborer, always a man in Hegel's account, learns at once that the, quote, object has independence and that he can perceive its independence only by having a relation to it. In short, work yields a consciousness fruitfully steeped in coeval interdependence. As Hegel concludes, quote, in this, it is in this way, therefore, that consciousness qua worker comes to see in the independent being of the object his own independence. Although Hegel here emphasizes independence, he is meanwhile describing the relational genesis and co-constituted interdependent ground of that independence. These are the passages, of course, that help to inspire Marx's theory of work and his effort to name the alienation from meaningful work under capitalism, although I believe the problem exceeds capitalism. Certainly these pa passages clarify how the fundamentally co-constituting labor-intensive conditions of existence install a dynamic interdependency and in turn an ethical call at the heart of relations. Empire builders eschew that call when they exploit productive labor and simultaneously disavow their dependence on its world-shaping efforts. Yet of course Hegel, while he foregrounds the Lord and Bondsman struggles, occludes another one, conveniently so for the world of empires. You can almost imagine a shadow flitting across Hegel's page, the background shadow of the laboring woman or women on whom his own work and household depend, not to mention his very existence. 
Given these conditions, many men have implicitly apprehended that in order to secure a firm sense of independence, which they are called on to do, they must simultaneously appropriate and denigrate, simultaneously appropriate and denigrate women's powers, claim affiliation and even appreciation, but within a severing stratifying structure of difference. Yet there is a struggle here too, and alliances and maneuvers in this arena as well, as A Thousand and One Nights makes clear, and I'll, I'll discuss A Thousand and One Nights briefly later. For the generative powers that women have developed as care laborers often includes, and of course, not only women are care laborers, so, but I am focusing on that aspect here. As care laborers often includes a vow, a vow of the generative interdependence with others and cultivation of the knowledge of the ways that independence and dependence can and indeed must coexist. As in the case of Hegel's bondsman, these experiences can foster a wisely dialectical self-relation and awareness. All the more, therefore, does a female laborer's self-consciousness threaten the stability of state power. As feminist scholars have long noted, ruling classes regulate sexuality in ways that serve to reproduce race and class hierarchies or caste, that is to secure the reigning group's power within kin lines and to ensure the reproduction of laboring classes, especially in systems of slavery, caste, and serfdom. More generally, the control of women through customs or laws that restrict their marriages within ranks, religions, races, or kin lines enable control of these stratifications. These determine the distribution of many other privileges and obligations as well, also installing uneven access to life-sustaining resources, water, land, animals, housing, air conditioning, travel, schools, systems. Of course, it, it's no surprise that um, in this light that Aristotelian political theory deemed control of women and slaves, quote unquote, in the household as the basis of the control of the polis. In short, women are conscripted into reproducing not just humans, but specifically positioned humans, be they rulers, merchants, or dig ditch, ditch diggers. And we do so in a world of vying defensive states with their vying hegemonies and economies. It is therefore no surprise, again, that any resistant or dissenting awareness on women's part, any feminist consciousness, must be attributed to outsiders, discredited as a form of threatening affiliation with other states. Indeed, we might recall that some of the most well-known stories of the world blame women for the downfall of states or for the colonization of it, from Cleopatra and Helen of Troy, blamed for the Roman of Empires, or in some anti-colonial narratives, women blamed for letting in the conquerors, as with the figure of Malak in Mexican tradition, or the adulteress blamed in Irish nationalist rhetoric for bringing, as Joyce puts it, the Saxon robbers here, parodying Joyce is doing here. Thus, even as men are authorized to disavow women's detain sustaining labors and discredit, her discerning strengths and strategies, sometimes under the guise of idealizing them, they are also given righteous permission to redirect women's powers toward men's ends, beginning with, and this should never be underestimated, men's release from the demands of nurturing and housekeeping labors. Meanwhile, in other arenas of geopolitical discourse, um, Imperialist narratives of history likewise rest on the disavowal of interdependent coevalness. Be it Britain, the US, or the Chinese Middle Kingdom, an empire often constructs itself as the center of the world while positioning other polities and regions as dependents, peripheries, or lesser rivals. Each empire understands its necessary dependence on trade relations and, uh, excuse me, each empire understates its necessary dependence on trade relations and alliances with others, including marriage alliances, and each downplays its re-instrumentalization of the infrastructures, knowledge, labor, and local governance of the communities it has colonized. The legendary notion of translatio imperio, imperi, implies that the triumphant empire has wholly usurped the central place of a prior reigning empire. Culture makers have sometimes countered these myths, yet 
given patronage, many have also played key roles in this disavowal, since empires have for millennia bestowed favor on the historians, authors, artists, and entertainers whose, whose legend making elides the state's violence and its beholdenness to a world of others. Fabian's account of racist denials of coevalness and contemporaneity with other peoples can also thus describe empire's illusion of the contemporaneity of other polities. These may include formidable rivals, neither conquered nor backward nor in, de in decline, but al alive and well, and therefore requiring discursive denigration, as in the characterization, characterizations of the Ottoman Empire as the sick man of Europe. The wide success of European empires in the practice of disavowal has, of course, issued in Eurocentrism and epitomized in Europe's claim to have created the quote-unquote modern world that's has superseded our quote-unquote dark ages. This is just a side point, but the continuing use in my mind of the words pre-modern and modern among diverse scholars in every discipline, including critical theorists, is a measure of this tactic's continuing success. To take account of this longer history is, I think, to begin one way of counteracting those disavowals on which imperial hegemonies depend. Said suggested as much in uh, cultural and imperialism, having noted that in addition to the British and the French, quote, the United States, Russia, Japan, and Turkey were also all imperial powers for some or all of the 19th century. Said proceeds to identify two persistent elisions in these imperialist naming of their situation. Quote, and this is Said, the fact of the contending native and the fact of other empires. Postcolonial scholars have richly theorized the actions of the contending native, but the determining force of a surround of other empires has received limited attention which has also obscured what this surround of empires means from the perspective of the colonized. Seeing that dynamism, we are better able to track the troubled dialectics of resistance, which I'll turn to next. Okay. I'm going to just quickly move through this next part. It is in the book. It's about how empires have fomented um, and supported minority rebellion in rival empires. Um, the British and other European empires fostered insurgency, of course, among indigenous peoples and enslaved communities, so as to destable the claims of the other empires in, in the uh, Americas. Um, and we can re easily think of more recent examples um, that among the U.S. and its imperial rivals. Um, so we've got Cuba and the Philippines at the turn into the 20th century, Iraq and Afghanistan throughout, and uh, perfectly apparent, it seems to me, in relations among Russia, China, the EU, and the U.S. today. This way of destabilizing other states and, you know, arming. Um, the oppressed or dissenting minorities in those states uh, for their own purposes. Um, so um, in this force field, anti-colonial struggle is clearly much more than us against them. It demands a certain hor horizontal alertness and strategies and affiliations that can grapple with that 360 degree surround of jockeying actors and states. Leaders in the 1960s of newly independent states understood this. It seems to me it's implicit in the word, in the phrase third world. Um, and, um, but again, not so much follow up on that um, outside the Cold War context. So um, there's this bit here on, on um, you know, what, what this inter, imperial model of, of what happens in certain regions allows us to see is that there are territories that are not strictly peripheral, but strategic hot inter-imperial inter zones, vital over for resources and laborers um, and their geopolitical situation. So situated across crossroads and sea lanes, parts of the Middle East and North Africa have been repeatedly invaded by empires from uh, Macedonian, Persian, and through Roman and Byzantine to Ottoman and European. Parts of Kashmir, as you well know, repeatedly invaded and claimed by vying empires with effects for today. 
um, theorists of, the, of Eastern Europe um, would say the same. In these regions, each invading empire has left its sediments in infrastructural, linguistic, epistemological, symbolic, and political forms, which then persist in that layered form to shape future conflicts. This has affected the dynamics of resistance and revolt. Um, laborers and other imperial actors have shrewdly yet precariously navigated within a multipolar, multiscalar field of power relations. Consider Toussaint Louverture negotiating with agents of the British Empire who offered arms and personnel to strengthen their battles against the French Empire. Roger Casement, Irish, negotiating with agents of the German Empire to win Irish independence from the British Empire. Sharif Hussein Ibn Ali, the leader of the Arab uprising against the Ottoman Empire during World War II, had been encouraged and abetted by the British Empire although eventually betrayed, as we know, um, in the Balfour Declaration. Although empires often win, it is also true that these resistance movements sustained in the background by labors of care also sometimes make gains or they have afterlives that um, inspire future movements. So I'm just gonna skip a bit here so I can move forward. Um, and yet, these geopolitical layers and conditions have made alliance building a difficult process. For as one set of dominant empires undercut and replaced another, layers of identity and language affiliations have formed, sometimes conflicting, um, have formed, sometimes creating conflict and making trust fragile and ethical choices fraught. So regions have not only formed as palimpsests of inter-imperial systems and infrastructures, but also as vessels of layered collective memory and cross-hatched identifications that can be rallying or divisive. Although cultures and communities are thus replete with cultural resources and seasoned forms of wisdom or humor, they are also sometimes replete with dreams of civilizational prowess once had but lost and memories of betrayal and sexual, racial, or religious trauma, all of which may be re-triggered by events in the contemporary field of inter-imperial relations. I might even venture to say that these long accruing, still active volatilities are the medium in which we live. They often comprise the field of churning relations in which we're called on to act, which again makes straightforward, straightforward alliances and ethical choices difficult. So as I hope to uh, indicate in the last section of the talk, literature has exerted a structuring force in this existential dialectical field in both oral and written forms. And it sometimes has addressed exactly these pressures and dilemmas. So, I have my eye on the clock. Um, I think I'll be fine, but I'll just stop if I start to go over. Um, how, how are you all doing? <laughs> are you with me? I'm with you. Okay. Yes. And you yes. can listen a little bit longer, maybe another 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Absolutely okay. no problem. All right, good. So storytellers, and of course poets and others, um, but I'm going to be talking about storytellers here, have often intentionally, if covertly, intervened in the dialectical volatilities of their time. In the book, I talk about A Thousand One Nights in Chapter Two. Um, if you haven't read that, I, I would love to uh, hear back from you if you do. Um, and um, and then later in the book, I talk about recent fiction. So I'm going to just try to give a, a, a synopsis of some of that here. Um, many of these storytellers, oral, sometimes women, you 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 know the all the you know complicated history and difficulty of knowing the anon authors of many uh, tale collections and all that. So. Um, but whatever their status or place, many of these tale tellers um, have, I would say, embarked on what Adorno called negative dialectical projects, um, encoding their own fraught inter-imperial conditions of production into their works. I'm going to especially highlight, um, I'll call them authors, experiments, experiments with historical temporalities by which I believe they expose both the overdetermined accretions of empires and convey 
the transformative power generated by art, especially as it generates listening and alliance across place, community, and time. So um, in the Thousand One Nights um, brief synopsis, I track the ways that it offers a deeply embedded structural critique of, of all of the elements I've just outlined um, and another model of relations embedded in listening and witnessing. Um, as you know, uh, scholars have talked about Dinarzad and Shahrazad and, and that whole situation, which I think is important. Um, I also highlight some other things. Um, I note that the storyteller Shahrazad is herself inter-imperially positioned within the frame of the tales, situated so as to straddle two eras and two empires. Um, that is, she's the vizier's daughter in a Sassanid empire of the, you know, uh, seventh century and earlier. Um, and that empire was defeated by the Umayyads in the seventh century. Um, and yet she tells tales of um, the eighth century Abbasid world um, of Harun, Harun al-Rashid, of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid. So, so she's in the seventh century uh, or earlier and telling tales of the eighth century or after. Um, so that an anachronism um, comments implicitly, I suggest, on the sedimented and dialectical co-constitution of imperial histories and formations. This frame also makes clear that the very order of empire rests on stratified divisions among servants, women's, and races, for it is the alliances among those groups reductively characterized in the frame as sexual dalliances of faithless wives, um, but it, it's the relations, you know, the scenes I'm talking about, I'm going to assume, that provoke the Shah to begin his wife killing. Um, the threat to the state is hinted at in several ways, especially in the pivotal role of Shahrazad's the vizier. Um, for as Saeed Arjumand has shown in his uh, study of early Islamic states, the vizier served um, a linchpin role uh, connecting culture, state, and economy. Um, so again, I expand on that in the book, but I'm just mentioning it here. Um, so um, in the nights, it's no coincidence that Shahrazad's vizier father uh, it is he who tells her a pair of animal tales in order to dissuade her from her effort to act in solidarity with the young women and Mary um, Shariar. Um, his tales feature, the vizier's tales feature an attempted alliance between a laboring ox and donkey when the ox offers the donkey advice about how to lighten his crushing daily workload. Strikingly, as the tales imply, the merchant who owns the animals defeats their effort at alliance through his monopoly of the powers of language and translation. He can understand the language of the animals. Given to him, the text hints in passing, by an unnamed sovereign power who will kill him if he shares the secret of the language. Um, so he hears the animals plan their strategy um, and he counteracts um, this so that in the end, the ox says, I, I have to change what I've said to the donkey or I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna die. Um, then the vizier tells a second tale. Um, Shahara says, I'm not deterred. He tells her a second tale about how the wife is interested in those powers of translation. Um, um, and the husband's about to go along and share the secret. But the rooster, not surprisingly, it's the rooster who tells the husband um, that, um, no, 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 no. You should push her into a closet, beat her with a stick until she cries out, I don't want to know anything else. Um, which he does, which works, and the household and the kingdom are all happy. Um, Shahrazad does not um, care about these tales. She says, I know many such tales, and of course she proceeds to tell them. And she says to Shahriyar, gives him a command, listen. Listen, she says to him. So you all know the story. Um, and um, she proceeds to wield the powers of state in this sense to um, change the direction of the state, which is having a sexual crisis. In the long 20th century of global inter-imperial wars and decolonial movements, and 
so including now, up to now, many authors have likewise positioned their protagonists between empires and experimented with ways of rendering the dialectics of coercion and the arts of transformative alliance. And I'll just name a few texts quickly here. 2000 Seasons, um, 1973, by the Ghanaian author Ayikwe Amar, <clears throat> traces a millennium of successive colonizations and successive resistance movements in West Africa. He's thinking here about, um, well, this is what his, his choral narrator says, um, we are not Europeans, we're not Christians, and we are not Arabs, we are not Muslims. And it goes, that's the position in which this community is placed. Successive colonization and sort of converging upon colonizations. That's his story that he wants to tell, third world author. Joyce, of course, opens Ulysses um, with Stephen Dedalus lamenting his position as, quote, the servant of two masters, an English and an Italian. In other words, he says the Imperial British state and the Holy Roman Catholic Apostolic Church. Um, I, having been raised uh, Irish American Catholic, would say, it, I would put it right up there, just like Joyce, <laughs> with, uh, I would put the Roman Church right up there with the British Empire. Um, we might say that in Night Town, Joyce takes us down into a mock epic rendering of the inter-imperial unconscious, where rituals of domination, interpolation, and humiliation play out over and over. And I don't know what you all think of this, but um, Mok Rajanan in, in uh, Untouchable, his day in the life um, novel um, of the Dalit protagonist Baka, has Baka perceived, quote, a common quality in the look of hate in the round white face of the colonel's wife and in the visage of the touched Hindu man who had beaten and humiliated him that morning. In these and other texts, the plots pivot also on gender crises, for instance, the coercions or violations of sisters, as in Baca's sisters. And I would read this as a symptom of what Joyce calls the brother motive in his critique of these dynamics. In all of these texts, what Rushdie called the ghosts of ancient empires are in the air in Midnight's Children, that text set amid inter-imperial wars involving Kashmir, as you know. Though I'm sorry to say that in my view, the masculinist elements of this haunted condition unfortunately also lurked as about in Rushdie's text, as they do in other works. Still, much is exposed there in that text. Yet in the tradition of Shahrazad, other authors have called out these continuing dis gender disavowals. Um, so in God of Small Things, likewise, sat amid inter-imperial wars, Arundhati Roy, again, you'll know this well, of course, traces her protagonist's family struggles, which culminate in the murder of her Dalit lover, Velutha, um, due to state-imposed love laws. As her narrator remarks, quote, actually, the problem began thousands of years ago before the British took Malabar, before the Dutch ascendancy, before Vasco da Gama arrived, before the Zamorin's conquests of Calcutta. Tellingly, as these texts open outward into long temporalities, more than critics have noticed, I think, and re creatively reframe these tales of long accruing power. They also work to capture the elided worlds of sustaining relations. They create retrospective and looping structures that generate non-chronological layered experiences of time. They seem to grasp Fabian's point that geopolitics have their ideological foundations in chronopolitics. On the one hand, many of these texts convey the overdetermined forces of histories. They write maybe critical dialectical phenomenologies, we could say, of this accruing history. On the other hand, in looping back from narrative moments of violence, rebellion, or overdetermined crises, their texts give us an opening in which to imagine the ways that these crises might not have happened. A few quick examples. Um, don't know who might know which of these texts, but in Jamaican author uh, Michelle Cliff's novel, No Telephone to Heaven, 1987, we continually approach a moment of revolutionary action set during the upheaval of the 1970s in Jamaica under Cold War inter-imperial duress. The scene that the novel opens with and continually returns to is that of an old truck 
lumbering steeply uphill on a muddy, broken road, hauling guns and people in khakis to the site where, although we don't know it yet, they will organize their insurrectionary attack. A novel unfolds in a looping structure, not unlike God of Small Things, um, repeatedly returning to this uphill journey at the beginning of chapters before the in insurrection and then circling back in time to approach that moment again from another perspective, each time carrying a new layer of backstory. So within each chapter, we loop backward through the protagonist Claire's early life, for instance, until at not, and then through other characters, um, until at novel's end, the truck arrives and the attack occurs, tellingly directed at a Hollywood film crew, exploitatively making a movie about revolutionary maroons. But the plan has been betrayed. All the revolutionaries are shot dead at the end. Cliff thus pointedly yokes together the overdetermined forces of history, including the media arts of US empire, with the history of resistance, that repeating uphill struggle. A range of recent novels craft uh, similar techniques. The main character of Rashid al daif's novella, Passage to Dusk, 2001, loses his arm from a shrap shrapnel blast during the Lebanese Civil War. He loses it again and again in the text's rendering as the first person narrator hovers on the edge of death and endlessly revisits the scene and its aftermath. Ken Signori understands this iterative technique as Middle Eastern authors attempt to capture the state of ongoing war in the region. We can also read its iterations as an embodiment of the ongoing resistance depicted in many decolonial novels. So, I do a whole bit um, about God of Small Things and the loops backward there. Um, and again, I'm assuming people will know, you know, these are history's henchmen beating uh, the Luther to death. There was no stray mugging or personal setting of scores. This was an era imprinting itself on those who lived in it. History and live performance. So these techniques are immersing us in histories that characters are living as uncertain but readers know the outcome and are already haunted by it. So with these looping structures, readers um, have are witnessing experiences that might have ended otherwise. Um, we're seeing them start over as if they might go somewhere else, maybe feeling hope for other outcomes while nonetheless girding ourselves for the inevitable overdetermined violence. And yet, although these looping structures often end in deadly violence, they simultaneously record other possibilities, in this way leading readers to invest in the potential for alternative pathways. For instance, um, as narratives step backward from the over-determined um, crisis, they create moments when characters begin to see and move toward other kinds of affiliation. Within one such loop, for example, the friendship between the twins and Sophie Mal and God of Small Things develops against their expectations and despite the grounds for distrust, the narrative lets us see that the children begin to form a bond. Similarly, in Carol Phillips' novel, A Distant Shore, Gabriel and Dorothy sense each other's sorrows and inch toward friendship despite the political and racial gulf dividing them up until the moment when great Gabriel is mur murdered by white racist thugs. By foreshadowing the event, the violence, and then whisking us back to a better moment in an alternative current of interactions, these texts gestured toward a path not determined and a future that is neither post nor colonial, in which the meanings of those words suddenly dissolve within an alternative language, like the one that Rahel and Estepen keep creating together beyond the hearing of adults. God of Small Things comments directly on how configurations of time affect action and how reconfigurations allow authors to raise questions about agency. In one striking sentence, Roy exposes the entrapment of time, capital T, and being, capital B, in constricting masculinist narratives, anticipating the insights of queer theorists such as Eve Sedgwick and Elizabeth Freeman. Roy capitalizes these words, time and being, as the brother-sister twins, Rahel and Esta, explain their temporary lack of a surname after their mother's divorce. Quote, for the time, capital T, being, capital B, they had no surname because Amu was considering reverting to her maiden name. 
though she said that choosing between her husband's name and her father's name didn't give a woman much of a choice. The everyday phrase here, for the time being, marks a brief lag in time created by Amu, a duration in which she belongs to neither father nor husband. Her choice to reject both alternatives and to linger with the effects of that refusal creates a moment of time being, a time outside regimented time. In turn, Rahel herself harbors an ambition to enter time differently, fantasizing about its unfolding. And I just have another page here. Quote, Rahel's toy wrist watch had the time painted on it, 10 to 2. One of her ambitions was to own a watch in which she could change the time whenever she wanted, which according to her was what time, capital T, was meant for in the first place. In effect, Rahel imagines that outside imperial time, another time being might arise, being might direct time. If in this way the forces of caste, colonization, sexual prohibition, and deadly violence that began thousands of years ago could at least temporarily be derailed, then the lived horizon might open more capaciously to tomorrow or to Mali, the closing words of the novel, a critical capaciousness Roy embodies by juxtaposing the English and Malayalam words. Not merely retrospective then, these texts undertake the worlding work that keeps alive a changing consciousness in the present and for the future. Their reconstructions of temporality recast history's progress, quote unquote, or development, quote unquote, as history's questions, including about how to act ethically and who to befriend in a pressured, precarious field of relations. Recreating how it feels to live inside the determinations, the determinations of history while apprehending suppressed and sustaining possibilities, they immerse readers, these authors, in decisions about when and where one enters the dialectic, to paraphrase African-American theorist Paul, Paula Giddings, when and where we enter, was her phrase about African-American women. They remind us that many before us have faced these questions and decisions. They let us feel the possibilities that might emerge when we fully avow and fully share the burdens of our difficult bodily and inter-imperial conditions of coeval existence. We all inherit many legacies that have been forged through the difficult work of alliance and action, even in a field of relations powerfully defined by centuries of coercion. Arts sometimes have carried those legacies and many artists have labored to persuade us that the narratives and the practices can change. The words and images are structures, they remind us, and the words or images can change. The time being is now, and the labors are ours together. I think we might say all of us are historical dialectics. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Laura, for such a wonderful presentation. Well, uh, I hope there will be questions and comments galore. So I will request uh, my PhD scholar, uh, Onik Dash, to moderate this session. There will be this interactive session when uh, I hope the audience will ask questions and ask comments. OK, I'm ready. Excuse me one second. Uh, thank you, sir, and uh, thank you, Professor Doyle, for your enriching as well as engaging session. Now I will be requesting the willing participants to type their questions, comments, remarks in the chat box. So, uh, so ma'am, do you want me to read out the questions from the chat box for you, or uh, do you prefer to directly uh, take it from the chat box? Um, were you directing that question to me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I would prefer you to you to read them. I'm I'm not good at yes. Okay, 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 ma'am. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, apparently, there are uh, no questions. So, but I have a question of my own. Uh, if I have the permission, uh, ma'am, you have spoken about uh, racial, uh, gendered, political, and material uh, relationality between individuals, communities, and states. Uh, so, my question is: What role can literature play in repositioning our understanding and sensitize us? uh in in uh respect to these relations so if you can uh, please elaborate on it mm -hmm. sure yes so the the last part of the lecture um was an attempt to to address that question um and i uh intend for that material to show that literature does this work um not only through you know uh telling certain stories that might not be known to others or that have been suppressed. Um, so not only in their content, but also in their form. Um, and that the form is important. Um, well, if we, the form is important for the way it is restructuring the relations themselves. So just to turn to A Thousand One Nights, um, when Shahrazad uh, presents herself um, to be the wife of Shariar, she, um, she has one condition, and that is that her sister um, come into the room um, after the deeds have been done and listen while she tells stories. Um, so what you have that what she's done in effect in that case is take um, the relation from one that is binary, the powerful and the powerless, or less powerful, um, and open it out into a triangle where there is a witness and there was, is someone listening who is basically an ally of hers. When the caliph allows that, well, the caliph is the wrong word, strike that. Um, when the Shah allows that, um, Shaharazad has won her first victory because she has said this is not a one-to-one -one power relationship. It's we, we exist in a field of relations. Um, and so I'll, I'll just leave that, that uh, kind of example at that. The others that I've talked about temporality, I, I think what they're, those texts are doing are really, I, I've learned from them. I'm trying to do what they did for me, which is to always have me think in the long historical perspective. Um, and it's been interesting to me how in, in many studies of, of literature of the oppressed, let's just say, um, that the long view that is often taken in the text in either content or form hasn't gotten much attention. I mean, it's gotten, and if it has, it's gotten certain kinds of attention that aren't to the point that I'm making about what we see when we see the long view. Um, it, to me, it's um, analogous to what we see when we realize the difference between me and another person. Oh, I can walk into that store and eat at that counter, but that person who has darker skin than me is not allowed to. So the horizontal view that uh, reveals uh, differences and similarities. Everyone in my family who has a white skin can do that, but other people can't. Um, it has one kind of effect, and I think the long view has a similar kind of effect. You start to see the patterns of, of both discrimination and possibility. So, um, so, so with that, uh, that way of opening up the long perspective for readers, I think is, is, is an important way that they uh, reshape readers' um, consciousness. I will just add to that that I think it's not just the long view, not just any long view, because lots of long views are quite imperial and civilizationist. Um, and that's problematic because the, the cohering of those formations has entailed many of the kinds, it has at least often entailed many of the kinds of disavowal and coercion and oppression that, um, that um, I'm saying these other authors are raising consciousness about when they give the long view. 
and they're pointing to different uh, the problems of a certain kind of affiliation that is all about a certain homogenous but stratified group. Um, so I'll stop there. I hope that addresses some of what you're wondering about. Uh, yes, yes. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, apparently, there are no questions in the uh, chat box. No. Uh, yes, yes. There is, there is one. Oh. Here we go. There, there uh, is one. I can see so, it. Actually. So the see. first question, uh, uh, mm -hmm. second question is, does individualism clash with relationality? How does the interaction of the two influence and shape our outlook on life? Question mm -hmm. is by Bikram Chaudhary. Mm. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, I mean, I think that uh, it's difficult. Uh, yes, they clash. Um, you know, all kinds of everyday experiences will teach us this, right? Um, so um, I'm living with my granddaughter. I'm re being reminded once again um, how she has certain desires. Um, and for the whole group to function, not all of those desires can be met. Um, so it happens on that scale. Um, and um, but I think that this is the, the sort of wisdom of the of the bonds man, bonds woman that I was talking about um, and trying to draw out of um, Hegel's material is that that's that's what we need to work on. Um, and that's part of our work. And that's what trying to build alliance um, teaches us. It's difficult. It's, it's very difficult. So much is often at stake. And that that's the work. Hope that answers. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the third question is, uh, you have referred to macro politics. Uh, could you explain its relevance to your talk today? Thank you for the question. Um, hmm. Well, um, I think I think of macro politics and micro politics as having a similar relationship to the global and the local. Um, so, and it both could be. Um, also aligned with the um, the old phrase, the personal is political. Um, so I do often these days think in terms of either concentric circles or our layers. Um, and so in my mind, the the macro politics of uh, I'll just say humans on Earth. Um, are, have been for so long creating the conditions of individual lives, individual moments on earth. Um, and the micropolitics um, in the United States, the phrase microaggressions has become very um, um, common now for understanding how racism works. You know, these subtle passive aggressive or whatever you might want to call them. Those are these little motions of life that happen from, you know, they make up a day, um, are, um, are just infused by and certainly directed by, I am so far still hanging on to my sense, my experiences that say not wholly determined by um, those power relations. I think I'll just, you know, use that phrase power relations. Um, Greed, the rest, you know, the desire to make what is make everything mine or in in my control. So, um, so I think um, macro politics is, you know, infuses like uh, like particles, uh, the our daily lives. And um, if we're going to understand each other and how to <laughs> deal with our current situations at all. We should be thinking about macro politics very closely in connection with micro politics or individual lives to pick up on the last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for patiently responding uh, to uh, all the queries. Uh, 
Now I will request uh, AB sir to uh, take over and give his concluding remarks. Over to you, sir. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Laura, for patiently answering all the questions. I have a comment to uh, make, you know. I, while listening to you, I was being reminded of the Kashmiri American poet Aga Shahid Ali, mm -hmm. uh, who actually talks about, you know, three cultures that were uh, related to three imperial pasts. You know, uh, so mm -hmm. I think, I think uh, uh, if you are, uh, feel interested, you can read his poems because, you know, he talks about the Persian, the Mughal, and the English empires in India because of her, his own uh, cultural as well as ethnic origins. So, yes, yes and, um, and, and, and because you are talking about coevality, and that's why mm. I was being reminded of Agha Shahid mm, mm. Ali. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, please. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, so, uh, and, and, you know, in the case of Aga Shahid Ali, because he had migrated to uh, and settled in, in the United States, especially in Arizona. So he talks about various pasts, the pasts of the Kashmiris in India and the desert people, you know, the, the various Indian tribes in the Arizona deserts. And, you know, he talks about their own traditions mm -hmm. and how, mm -hmm. uh, well, well, with the onset of the, uh, this uh, settlement by the Normans and all that, uh, the heritage was lost. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, um, well, um, uh, you know, uh, also um, Shahid, right? Shahid. Is Aga Shahid, Shahid Ali. Shahid is the name. I think he went by. He actually. Yes. Yes. Here. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, um, yes, I had cups of tea with Shahid and, and we only briefly touched on this because at that point I wasn't writing this book, but um, I should go back and read the poetry, you're right. I think the question of uh, traditions being lost as one set of people comes to where another set of people have been living um, and um, um, win the reins of power, um, I think that's a really critical um, tender point that is the you know one of the sources of difficulties so if your people came where my people were and the language had to change and the and the literatures that were honored were changed and the laws were changed and how could i not be angry at your people <laughs> but if it's also true that my people may have done some of that to other people yes then i need to be asked to think twice and um and and that's where we need to sit together and see what we're going to do about that because the memories i mean terrible violence happens right um and who isn't hurt who who wants to forgive forget that you know, there's a classic situation that is part of my life. So you know how Ireland was colonized by the British. You know, people call it the, the laboratory for British colonialism, all that. Kill the language, kill the people, steal the crops, you know, all of it. Uh, famine is, you know, developed in which they were just left to die. Um, the Irish come to unite to what you know was by then the United States. Um, actually, they come partly first as laborers, um, but then later um, migrating in the 19th and early 20th century. That's my grandparents came to the United States from Ireland um, and became rabid 
racists. Policemen beating black people. I mean, there it is. So, you know, that's the legacy I'm trying to figure out. Um, and also, I think it's just not enough to say, well, you did this to my people. It's not going to help us. Because if we don't somehow work our way past that, then it, the history is just going to repeat. You know, we can't keep holding the visions of revenge. It just can't help us. This is my belief. Um, so the, 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 the long view might help. Um, the, the wide listening of, you know, Dinarzad might help. Um, but that's, you're, you put your finger to me right on one of the most tender spots as, you know, is very clear in many places around the world today, of course, including India. Um, and so it's tough work. Tough yes. work. Yeah. Thank you, Laura, for this wonderful session. Thank you. Uh, we, we have been enriched and I, I was listening to it with rapt attention. But because I had muted myself, so when you asked repeatedly whether we, we could listen to you or not, we could hear you or not, I, 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 I took some time to unmute myself and answer you. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Yes, uh, with this we come to the end of not only this session, but ba Parle 2021. I must thank all the speakers for being with us and sharing their expertise. I must thank the audience for being with us. Yes, there have been difficulties regarding network and also some kind of apathy because there have been, you know, literally thousands of webinars and, and uh, uh, virtual speech, uh, uh, speeches. So we have tried to bring before you cutting as uh, edge research from India and abroad and young and experienced speakers have uh, uh, brought to us their research and their study. So thank you everybody. With this we come to the end of this session and meet you in the new year 2022 with Parle 2022. And let me assure you that we have already started contacting potential speakers from all over the globe and we hope to bring more fascinating lectures as one delivered by Professor Laura Doyle today. Thank you everybody and with this we just call it a day. Thank you Laura, thank you everyone. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, thank you for the wonderful work you're doing and I'd be happy to hear uh, from anyone and have further dialogue about anything I've said. So uh, appreciate uh, being with you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> the recording now.